All right, so we're going to continue our discussion of decomposition, and this is going to be focused both on terrestrial and aquatic processes. And I'm going to talk mostly about some of these large scale global decomposition studies that have um, taken place over the last, I would say, 20 to 30 years. Um, this is a picture of a bunch of leaf litter scientists from 2011. Uh, we all met up at the Coweta LTER, Long Term Ecological Research Station, down in the southeast. And our goal was to try to find decomposition studies from across the world to try to model decomposition rates in streams um, globally. And this led to a couple papers. The first one um, was published by the lead author, Jen Fulstead Shaw in 2017, that really focused on the influence of global temperatures on decomposition rates. And then um, another paper came out of it, uh, this plant phylogenetic history paper that I'll talk a little bit more um, in detail about. Here's a few other kind of big global studies that I've been a part of. Um, some are meta-analyses, kind of like the one I'm gonna go in to describe where you collect data from other published studies and you try to make sense of the large scale patterns across many, many data points that have been published already. And others like the two on the right um, were actually large scale experiments where we were involved in um, placing um, different substrates out in different parts of the world, all over the world. Um, we use the same substrates and so, um, the two on the right were both um, big studies looking at the rates of decomposition of um, pure cellulose in the form of canvas. Um, so artist canvas, you can cut into strips and then it becomes a really nice standardized substrate um, for looking at both terrestrial and aquatic decomposition rates. And so those two papers led by Scott Teagues and David Costello um, were both these kind of canvas strip studies that were done in, I, I think e each one of these, we have like 150 authors, co-authors, so easily um, across at least 150 sites. And each one of us, I think uh, we installed those cellulose strips at four different sites. So we're talking lots and lots of sites for those studies. So kind of getting back to this um, big meta-analysis study, um, we first focused on temperature and then I really wanted to take the data set a little bit further and look at litter quality across these global sites. And so you can see in the map on the top right corner, all of the locations and, you know, unfortunately, there's a pretty clear North American and European bias. Um, and that's true for a lot of ecology um, has to do with funding sources and just the kind of Western um, focus on natural systems and, you know, countries that have, um, you know, higher gross domestic product can put more investment into research than countries that have lower gross domestic product. So that's something to take with a grain of salt. I think anytime you're looking at a global, a global study of any kind is um, how well were the scientists able to access some parts of the world or how poorly. And so you can see we we did a pretty poor job in some parts, but the problem was that there's no data to include from these parts of the world. So um, anyway, that's kind of a subject for another topic or another day. But um, so to kind of explain where we're, where we are trying to go with this, I collaborated with Andrew Hip, who is a phylogeneticist at the Morton Arboretum outside of Chicago, and he helped me to understand that if you take a um, say like a, a tree, like a tree of life, a phylogenetic tree, and use this kind of circular tree. Um, where the, the very center of the tree is the um, common ancestor. And then, you know, organisms that are closer um, or that not necessarily closer in the tips, but, you know, you, if you've learned to read phylogenetic trees, you know, there's a little bit of um, spinning around that can happen. But, but regardless, say for instance, like these two species right here, um, no matter how you spin them around, they're always going to be really close to each other. In, in phylogenetic space on the tree. And so they're, they're very closely related genetically. 
and they tend to have, in this case, the same kind of color um, in this ring around the tree. And so the this color can represent something like decomposition rate, which is what we were doing, but it could also represent something like leaf size or percent nitrogen in the leaf or any of the variable, the various things that we've been talking about in this class. Um, and so if if you have a phylogenetic tree that maps that maps really nicely with some kind of trait, um, and in this case, it's showing you that like, okay, these these uh, species over here are all kind of light gray, and then we have two dark grays, and then this little clade has a little bit darker gray, but still lighter, and then you end up with this darker gray clade. What you're seeing is this has a really high phylogenetic signal. And we used um, something called Pagel's lambda to measure the degree of connectivity between the tree and the trait. But versus if you look over here, this has a very low phylogenetic signal. There's a really a lot of randomness. It's like light gray, dark gray, you know, lighter gray, lighter gray, really light gray. Like it's all kind of jumbled up. And so what this is saying is that there's there's a lot less of a phylogenetic signal for decomposition. And so we were, this is just to kind of like orient you to what we were hoping. We were hoping to see a high phylogenetic signal that plants that are more closely related genetically would have um, more similar decomposition rates, even when we look across the whole globe. And so um, what, what we found is it's a lot messier, right? <laughs> because you're looking at real data here. So this is, um, the angiosperms, all of the angiosperms in a phylogenetic tree, and actually the the um, the gray values closest to the tree that is their decomposition rate. And then we have all of these other things that we are also interested in, like the temperature of their growing location, precipitation, things like that, and then um, some other phylogenetic relatedness. And so what we found was we actually had a really strong phylogenetic signal. So it looks kind of random, but it actually, you know, you can see patches where colors come together. And so this was the first study to show that plant phylogenetics can um, help understand decomposition at a global scale. So it's not all just about temperature and precipitation at a global scale, but there's a really, there's a really strong influence of who is decomposing, what what species of tree are you and how, um, and then that, that decomposition um, rate is influenced both by the environment, but also by um, phylogenetic differences among the individual trees. And this is really similar to um, the paper, the Crowther et al. paper um, that shows the same kind of thing, but this case, it's, um, all, it's like the tree of life and it's showing you what's what kinds of functions in the soil um, are um, basically um, done like <laughs> by these different organisms. And so you can look at say wood wood decomposition. You can see um, here and here and then a little bit over here. Um, something like methanogenesis is really rare um, and it only occurs in this group of organisms. So it's kind of a similar, I just wanted to show you that it's a really similar um, display and it's trying to show you something um, that's the same. But what you can see is that carbon mineralization <laughs> is something that everyone does, right? So that's why, why respiration is such an important part of this decomposition process. Okay. So the other thing that we did in this big study um, where we met up at Coweta is that we tried to kind of compare this original um, litter quality um, to decomposition rate diagram that was um, done by Webster and Benfield in the 1980s. We tried to update it. And so you can see the orange um, circles are the Webster and Benfield data. And then from our new global study, we were able to really kind of like blow that out a little bit. And so you can see there's a lot more variation in some um, groups of plants. So these are all again, now we're back to the plants, um, all of the angiosperms and um, even a few gymnosperms and ferns and things that were included. Um, 
yeah, so we have a better sense now. Um, this was, you know, this 1986 paper, they were compiling data from far fewer studies. Now we have a better sense. We've been able to constrain um, what we know about potential decomposition rates. And in some cases, it widened the variation quite a lot because there were lots of studies um, that were examining these species. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a couple other really cool global decomposition studies. This one is called tea decomposition. Um, and so what is in a tea bag other than bits of tea leaves, right? And tea is a shrub, um, different types of teas, right? But but the, the tea plants tend to be evergreen shrubs. Um, in this case, um, these scientists often from Europe developed this idea to just basically put tea bags out because they're already in a neat little package. They use these kind of pyramidal shaped tea bags that have plastic, um, a plastic mesh on the outside so that the bag itself doesn't decompose, which is kind of a problem. Um, but the cool thing about these studies are that they're really easy to deploy. You just have to buy tea bags and then weigh them. They're very standardized, you know, tea companies don't want to give you more tea than they have to, right? Um, it's expensive. And so they tend to be pretty standardized in how much tea is in each bag. And if you want to learn more, there's a cute video um, at this website um, that you can follow up with. Um, this tea composition study, there's actually, I think there's two studies, unless they're related. Um, from what I can figure out, there's 570 terrestrial sites, 300 aquatic sites. Some are freshwater, some are marine. They have put out 80,000 tea bags um, and over 300 institutions across all of these different climate zones. Now you can see um, a lot of these studies have happened in Europe, but they've actually done, um, you know, a pretty a good job of getting some, you know, more sites in South America. Always a problem, you know, always challenge to get um, these studies uh, deployed in Africa. Um, it's just hard to get there. And um, you know some some decent coverage in um, Asia. Here's some pictures from a separate um, study called the Tea Bag Index, and here they have a different website, but it's pretty much using the same method. So they again use these rubose and green tea plastic bags. Um, you can see sometimes they're burying them, sometimes they're diving down into the water to deploy their tea bags. Um, they're, you know, involving community science, um, you know, children and school projects. And here you can see the, the tea bags after they've been um, incubated, waiting, you know, in little cupcake <laughs> tins to dry. This study, they just have them drying out on a table in the sunshine. So pretty a pretty ingenious method, I think. Um, you can get involved yourself through both of these websites. You can do your own tea bag studies and um, upload your data and expand the number of sites that they're uh, that they're using. So it's a pretty cool project. And then this last one, um, there's of course many more of these, but I just want to highlight this one because um, some students in my lab and I are getting involved in this project that's being run through the University of Maryland at Baltimore County. Um, they're interested in land use effects on decomposition. So this project will kind of will place leaf litter bags. They're going to send us some leaves and some bags, and we have to collect our own leaves to add to it. We're going to um, choose a forested site on campus, an urban stream site, an agricultural stream site, and then a forest plantation site. And so this will be all um, decomposition in streams, but they're trying to get lots and lots of people involved all over the world. Um, again, to kind of try to tease apart, what is it about the environment? Is it temperature? Is it uh, precipitation? Or could it be, you know, um, land use? Um, could that influence decomposition rates? So really fun time to be involved in a lot of these big studies. And I'm just going to talk about two historic studies, or I guess I'd say both historic and current studies. So this is Mark Harmon. He's a scientist. I think he's retired now at o Oregon State University. But in 1985, he started a 200-year 
log decomposition study out at the H.J. Andrews LTER. These long-term ecological research sites are really, really important. They're funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, they allow scientists to set up large-scale and long-term studies in a way that we're really not um, able to do in a lot of other situations. Um, here at Evergreen, we're really lucky to have our uh, forest reserve, which has kind of acted like an, a little mini LTER, um, at least for the last 18 years since we've been here. But um, a lot of really cool long-term research has happened in these um, LTER sites over the years. So here um, you can see Sarah Green is directing the placement of a log back in 1985. Steve Carpenter is doing a fungal production survey on some of the logs. They'll go in and they, they cut cookies off of the logs and they um, assess their decomposition through time. Here you can see Annie Hamilton sampling logs in 1988. Um, some of the logs I think were um, protected either by plastic or mesh. There's a lot of um, sub projects within this project, but the overall goal was to, to establish um, the study of logs for over 200 years. Um, here's Jack Booth tracing some patterns of decay in 19, 1982. This must have been prior to the establishment of the study, unless I got the dates wrong. I, I, I looked it up today and I, I was pretty sure it was 1985, but it could be that they um, they had some earlier work too. And then here um, they're placing some logs in Lookout Creek. I don't know for sure if any of the logs that they've been studying the decomposition rates of are actually placed in the stream, um, but they certainly were placing uh, logs in the streams for fish habitat out at the LTER. And um, yeah, it must be some, some of the logs. So they're here in a uh, log jam in the stream looking for tagged logs. So Janice Harmon and Randy Wildman doing this work. So all of these photos are from Mark Harmon. And um, here's some pictures from some publications. So you can see the construction of insect enclosures used in the log decomposition experiment. So that's these um, kind of tents to try to figure out who's, who's growing in the log and then emerging. Um, the, they put the logs on screens so that they could kind of separate what was coming from the log versus from the soil. And then um, they constructed these enclosure frames and inside you can see the log inside the enclosure. And then they would cut cookies off and they would take images and measurements um, over the years as the experiment went on. So um, I, I'm assuming that the LTER, because the H.J. Andrews LTER continues to this day, they've gotten continuous funding. I'm assuming that the studies are continuing on the logs. Um, we may have um, opportunities to visit the site in the future and um, we'll have to ask and ask to see the logs. Okay, another big um, leaf litter decomposition study in this case that's important to talk about came from the Coweta LTER site in North Carolina. And this was started in 1993. They actually tried to exclude all leaf litter from one entire stream, and then they compared it to a control. Um, the problem with these really large experiments is that it's a lot of work to exclude all of the leaf litter from a stream. And so often we can only do that for one stream. And so it, it, this, a lot of these large scale experiments lack replication. So um, it would be great to have been able to do this for five streams compared to five control streams, but that's just beyond the scope of what's humanly feasible sometimes. So what they did is after excluding leaf litter, they measured all kinds of um, things in the, in the water and they found that the dissolved organic carbon content in the water was reduced by 30% and the stream insects all but disappeared. So most stream insects um, were no longer there. Once the leaf litter um, and the wood inputs were gone from the stream, there was really not a lot to keep them there. And this was all published in 1980, 1997. 
Um, and here's just some pictures from, from the litter exclusion study. So you can see kind of a, a netting coming over the top of the stream and it was the entire watershed. And then eventually, I think I have some better pictures here. You can see the leaves, you know, being excluded. They had to also build these kind of nets along the side to keep leaves from floating in or uh, blowing in sideways. And then eventually they started adding substrate back in. So they took out all the wood, they took out all the leaves, they measured um, the stream for a few different years. And then they thought, well, what is it? Is it the is it actually the organic matter that they're that these insects need, or is it just the physical structure? So they added a bunch of plastic back in as physical structure that wouldn't provide any nutrients. And they kept the plastic in for a few years. And then they pulled the plastic out and they put they started putting in known quantities of wood and leaves to try um, to see what would happen and how long it would take the, um, the insect community to recover. So it's a pretty interesting study to try to tease apart these different, the different roles that um, organic matter plays in streams, both as a nutrient source and a food source, but also just as a physical structure um, or, you know, something to live on. So, um, so here's some figures from the book, from the paper, from the Wallace et al. 1997 paper. What they found was that um, this variable on the Y is basically um, how much um, it's secondary production. So primary production you've understood already as plant growth, secondary production is often the organisms that eat the plants. And so we're looking at basically insect biomass here in grams of ash-free dry mass per square meter per year. And what we what they saw was that when they started excluding the leaf litter and the wood, you see a drop in that insect biomass, pretty, uh, pretty severe drop versus the reference site, which um, stayed the same and then even got more. Maybe, you know, some of the insects flew <laughs> from the excluded stream over to the reference stream, who knows, um, versus a uh, moss covered bedrock um, stream where there was still a drop, but it was less important. So, um, there was still moss on the rocks as substrate and food in this system. And there was really not much at all left in this system. So um, yeah, just a few more things to say as we wrap up decomposition. Um, I thought this might be useful to you as you're kind of trying to understand your redox again. Um, so the oxidation of organic carbon, uh, what all is happening? So denitrifying bacteria take nitrate and turn it into nitrogen gas. Manganese reducing bacteria take manganese four and turn it into manganese two. Iron reducing bacteria take iron three and turn it into iron two. Sulfate reducing bacteria take sulfate and turn it into sulfide um, or sulfur gas. And each of these organisms is also giving off CO2 in terms of respiration um, as, that, as that happens. The, um, and then aerobic fungi and bacteria um, are basically um, you know, eating the carbon and turning it into um, CO2. I'm not sure why this doesn't say CO2 right here. Um, Anyway, this might be a helpful diagram for some of you. It might be too complicated for others of you. So, you know, don't worry about if it if it's too complicated. Um, but I was trying to put some of this into some context of redox a little bit. And then lastly, I'd be remiss um, in talking about decomposition if I didn't talk about methane. Um, in particular, methane is produced during the decomposition process when there are there's low oxygen. Um, and so under anoxic or very low redox conditions, you get fermentation reactions that can yield methane. And so um, ancient methanogens, methanogen means an organism that produces methane, generates methane. Um, they produced a lot of the natural gas deposits that are deep in the earth today that we use for natural gas. And so methanogenesis we know has been happening for a long time. Um, there are also methylotrophs. These are organisms that eat methane. 
um, and they can harvest energy by oxidizing um, methane. And that helps to keep methane from entering the atmosphere. Um, and then even larger organisms can sometimes eat the methanogenic bacteria. And especially in some lakes, um, they've found that Daphnia, which is a little tiny microscopic crustacean can receive up to 50% of the carbon that they need from um, eating these methanogenic bacteria. And of course they're using stable isotope analysis to figure that out. So the picture is actually um, a picture of a lake and the bubbles are bubbles of methane that get frozen in the ice as the ice uh, layers are developing. And so scientists can actually, in the winter time, we can count bubbles and measure the area of bubbles in trapped in the ice to determine how much methane is probably being pumped out of a system in a kind of a cool time-lapse way of, um, of watching it. And there's a really cool video, I'll let you watch it on your own, that shows, um, these scientists counting the bubbles, talking about methane, and then, um, you know, to kind of like <laughs> hit home the fact that this stuff is actually methane, that methane is coming out of these, these lakes under the ice. They can break through the ice and as they do it, light the air on fire and it usually produces a big fireball of basically natural gas. Um, so it's kind of a fun video to watch. And of course, methane is really important. It comes from a lot of natural sources. So especially wetlands, um, a small amount from rivers, animals, wildfires, termites, geological sources. Um, anthropogenically, it comes from agriculture. So a lot of um, cow byproducts, um, biomass burning, fossil fuel burning produces methane. Um, and uh, the sinks, so some a lot of it gets lost to the atmosphere, um, and warming we think may increase a lot of these fluxes, especially from wetlands and peat peatlands and permafrost. Um, we're worried that permafrost is going to become a much bigger source of methane um, under warming conditions and similar to streams and wetlands. So to summarize, decomposition is. Um, the major avenue of carbon loss from ecosystems. And we determine um, decomposition rate or decomposition rate is influenced primarily by the same factors that regulate net primary productivity. Decomposition is very sensitive to global changes and has potentially large feedbacks to climate, climate warming um, because of the production of CO2 and methane um, through these processes. So hopefully that was fun. Um, we'll catch you next time.